thank you again uh, for taking the time to, to present with us today. Uh, without further ado, I'll let you get into your presentation and we'll, uh, we'll take questions and answer at the, at the end if there is time. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, uh, uh, the uh, organizers, for inviting me uh, to give uh, this talk about uh, some of the work that we are doing here at EPA, uh, specifically uh, looking at a, uh, a hepatic steatosis as an adverse outcome and investigating quantitatively the role of uh, diet and chemical exposure uh, through nuclear receptors in the liver. Uh, but let me first start by uh, talking about where does this work uh, fall within the uh, overall strategy of uh, uh, our uh, next generation uh, blueprint of computation tox computational toxicology as it was published uh, by uh, Rusty Thomas. So in, in that vision, uh, we look at the, uh, uh, the, the world of, of chemical ex chemicals and chemical exposure and toxicology in terms of uh, three tiers. Uh, the first tier would uh, look at a broad coverage uh, high content assays trying to identify biological targets or pathways for chemicals that uh, we are studying. Um, in some situations, uh, this information may not lead itself to any biological target uh, or, or a defined pathway, and therefore we probably have to resort to, uh, 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 to estimating points of departure, which are uh, related to the dose response relationships that we use for risk assessment. Uh, using uh, 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 similar uh, or uh, uh, predicted biological pathways. In other situations where we do have defined biological pathways, we move on to the next phase or the next tier, which is really designed some of the in vitro assays, specifically looking at uh, initiating events and key events in, in, in the way of the biological uh, processes leading to an adverse outcome. That could lead us to a, and the concept of an AOP, which is an adverse outcome pathway. It's a series of key events, which starts with an initiating event uh, where the interaction of a chemical or a xenobiotic with that, that event, that biological event will, uh, will ensue a cascade of events uh, all the way leading to uh, phenotypic or an adverse outcome pathway, such as in this case, hepatic steatosis or buildup of fats in the liver. Now, all of this uh, is probably is all of this is uh, it could be done through uh, computationally through Q QSAR or, or chemical structure and properties related uh, information, or it could be done in the lab in terms of looking at the in vitro assays uh, and the high uh, content assays. Uh, but in but it, the ultimate uh, application of this, uh, once it's defined, is to really look into uh, obviously human populations and exposures and how the exposure to chemicals can lead itself to that adverse outcome. And that's where we have to resort to uh, looking into ways to move from in vitro to in vivo and also try to uh, establish a dose response relationship quantitatively perhaps looking at information from the literature and so forth. So that work that I'm talking about falls within that systems modeling of the overall vision of uh, computational toxicology at the Office of Research and Development here in ORD. Uh, specifically, like I said, we are interested in taking that AOP, moving it, uh, understanding the in vitro relation, uh, relationships between the key events and applying systems modeling to get to the uh, points of departure. Uh, so in that situation, what we do usually have is an, a, a, an identified uh, adverse health outcome, such as, uh, you know, like I said, uh, a neurotoxic event or a, or a, uh, or a buildup of fat uh, in, in the liver or in, in hepatic steatosis or, or adverse outcomes in general. And then from those, we get the adverse outcome pathway based on uh, the tiers that I've described or based on literature. Uh, specifically, importantly, here is the molecular initiating events. Those are the events at the at the beginning of a of a pathway that again will be the interaction between a chemical and the biological processes leading to the to the adverse outcome. And then we get the in vitro high throughput assays related to these initiating events. Now we have to move on to uh, that in vitro assay. How does what does that mean in terms of in vivo? Specifically, looking at uh, uh, exposure or at um, at, equi at at uh, at administered doses, human administered equivalent doses that we can obtain through reverse dosimetry uh, by making the assumption that the in vitro assay 
uh, the levels in in vitro assays will be equivalent to a level of uh, of these chemicals in vivo uh, in in the tissue in the target tissue where the where the initiating event resides, and so with reverse dosimetry we can estimate this. This is where PVBK comes in, but then eventually also we need to link all of this to real life, which is exposure models or exposure uh, measurements uh, in the environment for the actual uh, levels of exposure that. Uh, that are people are exposed to, and then the comparison between what's real, what, what's happening in, in in terms of real exposures to the estimated AOB based uh, based uh, estimates of an equivalent dose in humans. That gives us what we call the margin of exposure, which is something we rely on to see how uh, uh, chemicals are uh, 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 in a way regulated in the environment. So uh, specifically here, the adverse outcome, like I said, is the hepatic uh, fatty acid accumulation. And we're interested in this because uh, fatty liver disease affects about 20 to 30% of the population. I'm, I'm sure that many, many people in the audience uh, uh, are familiar with this. And then hepatic steatosis is characterized obviously by intracellular increase of the free fatty acid and triglycerides. Uh, the major contributors to uh, hepatic steatosis uh, uh, are alcohol consumption and also some environmental chemical exposure. We're interested in the environmental aspect of it. So the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, is also defined as the accumulation of fat in the liver above 5% of the liver weight. That's the definition. And uh, this happens through mechanisms in, in, uh, in the liver through de novo synthesis of the uh, fast and usually happens through uh, the glucose pathway uh, uh, from diet. And also uh, there is the possibility of the transport of free fatty acid from blood, uh, you know, such as uh, 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 the equilibrium between fat, between fat and the tissues and the blood. And then some of that uh, moves into the liver as I will show you. So those two, those are two ma major mechanisms. Well, these mechanisms have been included in a very uh, expansive model uh, that looked at uh, hepatic steatosis and actually more or less at energy production in, uh, in the liver or in the hepatocyte uh, uh, from uh, using uh, glucose or fat in the diet. And that model was published by um, Ashworth, uh, uh, with the publications uh, uh, given here. Uh, and they have, like I said, have done an expansive work to look at the, at, at the, at the biochemical pathways leading or processes leading to, uh, to the production of ATP and also uh, fat. Uh, the, uh, the, the four, the, their model included the, uh, uh, the four epical pathways that are usually related to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, buildup of fats in the liver. And they include, like I said, de novo synthesis through uh, the glucose pathway or uh, transport of free fatty acids uh, from the plasma to the hepatocytes or uh, actually the, the exit of fatty acids, uh, free fatty acids and triglycerides from the hepatocytes to the uh, systemic circulation through the uh, VLDL, uh, the very low density lipoproteins. Uh, any inhibition of that could uh, could lead to the buildup of, of, of fat in the in the liver, uh, and also the metabolism of fats, the catabolism through the beta oxidation pathway. So they included all of these mechanisms, which to us was uh, was really nice, so that we can investigate all of these mechanisms computationally. However, our interest was more or less related to the nuclear receptor role in the in these processes and for this the two major nuclear receptors are lxr and pxr and lxr is more or less related to the uh the, the to the synthesis of uh, free fatty acids uh through uh, uh the srepp uh, uh, uh proteins and the sc uh, d1 and fas uh, proteins also included in this process for the uh, formation of the fatty acids. And the fatty acids themselves can also be catabolized, if you will, through the beta oxidation pathway. So that's a, path, that's a pathway that could impact the concentration or levels of free fatty acids or triglycerides. Uh, PXR, on the other hand, is more or less related to the translocation of a, an important receptor uh, uh, or transporter, which is the CD36 
that is involved in the exit of the free fatty acids or the uptake of the free fatty acids from uh, plasma uh, into, into, uh, into the hepatocytes. And uh, we're interested in those nuclear receptors because again, like I said, that could be built, that we could use this kind of relationships to build an AOP, if you will, uh, for the buildup of fatty acids through these nuclear receptors and the, the, the introduction of chemicals, in our case would be environmental chemicals, let's say, uh, to this pathway uh, can be through these initiating events, which is the binding to the nuclear receptors. So we had to go through the literature and, 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 and those introduction or the introduction of these nuclear receptors to the hepatocytes, uh, fatty acid uh, uh, synthesis uh, and degradation uh, is, was uh, our addition or contribution to uh, the model that was published earlier uh, by Ashworth. Uh, but looking at the, uh, the data that we needed for this specific kind of, uh, for, to, to quantitate, quantify these specific relationships, uh, we had to resort to literature and the typical uh, uh, synthetic chemicals that are used uh, for the study in vitro for the uh, nuclear receptors uh, uh, involvement in, uh, in free fatty acid buildup or uh, synthesis uh, are uh, TO901317, and that's a synthetic chemical. And rifampicin, which is I'm pretty sure a lot of people are uh, familiar with, uh, uh, involved in PXR. T0, as I'm going to call it from now on, is uh, actually involved in both PXR and LXR activation, which came really very handy for us in the way we quantified relationships. And the GW3965 is another synthetic chemical that is only impacting LXR. So we had, a th we had three chemicals here in the, in, in the literature that are involved in either PXR, LXR, or both, as, as is shown with the T0 here. Then the next step was uh, to take the available information from literature uh, that, again, uh, is, is related to these three chemicals, uh, or uh, yeah, three chemicals, uh, and uh, uh, quantifying these, uh, these in, this information. So, uh, the in vitro data that we use came from a study by Metro et al. Um, and in that situation, we had a, a dose response relationships as shown by these experimental data, the dots for uh, the uh, chemical concentration and uh, in this situation, the, the uh, fold induction of PXR activation. And also they did the same th thing with LXR with uh, uh, the chemical concentration. Like I said before, uh, these dose response relationships we obtained from literature and we, we fit these relationships empirically uh, through uh, mathematical equations to describe them. So that's why you see a real nice fit because this was a, a real empirical equation. It wasn't like a model optimized uh, mechanistic uh, uh, relationship. It, it, more or less, it was just a curve fit. Uh, and for that reason, uh, you could see that the rifampicin uh, relationship is in the red, and in the in the black here is the uh, is the T zero, and T zero uh, is involved, like I said, in PXR, while rifampicin is solely involved in PXR. And then and in this graph here, we'll see uh, the GW, which is only LXR uh, activator. But T again is also included here with uh, the activation of LXR through our empirical equation and the data from Metro et al. Interestingly here, the one thing that we can see from this relationship is that the, the fold of inductions for these receptors is not really very far, uh, very comparable uh, in terms of these chemicals. Uh, uh, maybe the slopes are, you know, could be a little different or, uh, but but in, in general, we're not talking really very much differences here in terms of, of their ability to activate these nuclear receptors. However, their potency will be different, as I will show you later. Uh, moving along, then we had to really build this uh, step by step by looking at, well, okay, if we get the, uh, the nuclear receptor activations, then we need to, in the case of PXR, look at the relationship between um, PXR itself or sorry, between the chemical and the induction uh, of, of the uh, transporter uh, uh, CD36. Th uh, and again, uh, it happened that from the same study, Metroid all this was measured and we empirically uh, used these relationships. We did the same thing 
with the uh, steroid uh, regulatory uh, protein here, which is the SREP1C that's involved in the synthesis. Moving along, we still built uh, all these, we filled in all this information from the in vitro data to get to the, uh, to the uh, relationships that will help us build uh, the mechanistic model uh, quantitatively uh, leading to the uh, to the fatty acid uh, synthesis or transport. So I'm going to go ahead and move uh, to the next slide uh, to basically, again, this is similar work that we did. These, are, these relationships were inferred from the, uh, from the previous ones we did, uh, specifically looking at uh, LXR, for example, with uh, uh, the uh, SREP protein relationship and PXR with the CD36. Now that we have quantified or we had established empirical equations based on in vitro relationships uh, to build up the model uh, from the nuclear receptors to fatty acid uh, relationship, uh, to fatty, uh, fatty acid uh, content in the liver, we had to start thinking about the in vivo, which is the moving this relationship from in vitro to in vivo. And this is where uh, PBBK comes in. So obviously, we would be interested in the liver concentration of any chemical. And our situation here would be interested in the liver concentration of rifampicin or the T0 or GW. And then once that level of concentration is reached, it will trigger the empirical equation that were established before for the nuclear receptors moving all the way to the to the uh, to, 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 to interface with the Ashworth model, which is a complicated model that we had in the literature given us the uh, the estimate of how much free fatty acids uh, were synthesized or transported or degraded. And uh, we used GastroPlus and Admit Predictor or Admit Predict to develop our PVDK for rifampicin. And we looked at data from literature for rifampicin specifically. There was some information uh, for two studies that were for people who were given IV doses of, uh, this one was about, I think, 300 milligrams, and this one was 600 milligrams, and they monitored the levels of the chemicals through time. And so we tried to uh, uh, we tried to model this uh, using GastroPlus and Advit Predictor. For the other two chemicals, the T T0 and GW, there's no data available because they're synthetic chemicals that are Used, that were used in the studies and in vitro studies, but they we didn't we could not find any chemical or any uh, time course data for the plasma to help to help us uh, verify the models. Nonetheless, we used GastroPlus and Admit Predictor to give us uh, predictions and estimates that we can use uh, for our uh, in vivo to in vitro uh, extrapolation for these two, two chemicals. Well, what do we get out of all of this is uh, the Ashworth model, the original model was built on diet. So that's why you see the cyclic relationships here. It's really when people have, a, when people eat food and then, you know, uh, uh, then, then the next meal and the next meal. And every time food is taken in, uh, there is glucose and there's fat in the food. There's established levels of those glucose and, and fat levels in the food that are in, in the Ashworth publication, they call normal levels that, you know, people, uh, would have in their diet, okay? And then uh, within those, you'd see that there is an uptake of, uh, of the hepatic free fatty acids in each time the meal is consumed. The question becomes to us is, uh, what would be the impact then of the nuclear receptors and the chemicals? And this is where we use the model that we had uh, developed. And then we just used an estimate of whatever. So somebody having a 10 milligram per kilogram per day exposure to these chemicals, what would be the impact on the free fatty acids in the liver? And as you can see from this, the green would be very close to the baseline, which is the GW. So the synthesis is happening, but it's not as is is that is, is going. The synthesis of the of the free fatty acid is going uh, very close to the uh, to the diet itself, as, as we expect. Uh, however, in the case and when we have rifampicin, for example then there is an increase, and that could be from the uh, uptake from the serum as the uh, fat is being absorbed from the, from the diet. Uh, and so that enhances that, uh, that, uh, that the, the, the concentration of free fatty acids. Now, when we have T0, you can see there's a much bigger uh, influence, and this, this has to do with the fact that T0 impacts both synthesis and transport of free fatty acid from, from plasma. 
Uh, the interesting thing is to see is that the transport of, of, of free fatty acid from plasma has a, in general, has a bigger impact uh, than it does the synthesis uh, of, of these free fatty acids. Uh, then the next question we asked is, well, what happens in the situation where we have different, situ different levels of fat uh, or glucose in the diet in combination of the, uh, in this situation, we looked at all of them, but interestingly, the T0 was the one that has most impact. And you can see here, for example, in the case where there's no, you know, for it's fasting, you know, there's really little amount of free fatty acid that are being built up. Um, and then, then you can see that in a diet that doesn't have fat, but it has glucose, then that's the impact of the, the liver is making its own fat. And then in a normal diet, like we see, we have higher levels of glucose and higher levels of fat and the T0, like I showed before, uh, it would increase the, the uptake uh, of, or it would increase the uh, concentration of free fatty acids in the, in the liver. And then, um, and finally, this is the impact of what would happen if we would have a higher level of fat in the diet, as you would expect, there would be higher level of accumulation of free fatty acids in, in the liver. So all of this would be simulations based on our analysis, quantitative analysis of the available in vitro data in the literature, along with using uh, Gastro Plus and Admit Predictor estimates of concentration of the chemicals in the liver to conduct an in vitro to in vivo uh, extrapolation for the, for the quantitative AOP uh, that we had uh, established. So in conclusion, uh, like I said, we have developed an integrative overall PBBK hepatic lipid quantitative AOP model. Uh, that approach provided insights into mechanistic dose response relationships. Uh, we had uh, used the data from the literature and those the epi data whenever it's available and uh, targeted experiments like the ones that were done in vitro that we were lucky to, to have available and obviously the modeling uh, efforts that we did. All of this can help us to identify and quantify health risks to humans when it comes to exposure to chemicals that can behave similar to the ones we studied here. So obviously the two synthetic chemical T0 and G D GW uh, are, no, are not of interest to us because you will not find them in the environment, but uh, chemicals that uh, bind to LXR and PXR there will be some uh, in the environment and we can use this type of modeling to, to assess the dose response relationships for these chemicals. On the other hand, for people who are interested in drugs, these events, uh, the mechanistic events through these modeling could be also targets for therapeutics or drugs or things like that. So um, fatty lipid, and then we uh, identified that the fatty lipid accumulation of liver is more impacted by the transport from the from fed uh, from the blood which has to do with uh, diets and also has to do uh, with how much fat content uh, a, a person has um and again co-exposure to chemicals like i said can enhance the uh, the the hepatic uh, fatty buildup uh, which could lead to steatosis which could lead to uh to other adverse outcomes that uh uh, uh could be uh, dangerous 